Hey all, it's Ryan here from Prof Talk Uber. Uh, good to see you. Um, this is a bit of a different video. There's been some time since I've last talked about anything related to my books, and I do have plans to return to my lore and story of series for my story so I can give high quality recaps of the various books and chronological timeline of everything. That's not what gonna be this is. I'm going to be talking about the book that I have started working on now that I'm kind of back in a more creative headspace, 12 Monoliths, Book 7, Death of the Good People. So this is a bit different than what I initially planned to be the 7th 12 Monoliths book, and this is not typically what was expected for people who finish Book 6. Um, there are some pretty large and important cliffhangers at the end of the last one that we're just going to have to let stew for a bit. Um, and behind the scenes, some pretty massive changes have happened concerning the length of the rest of the 12 Monolith series, as three whole new books have spawned as ideas to work off of, which means that you're all going to get three new books to enjoy in the interim before the book that was originally going to be 12 Monoliths Book 7 comes out. Um, so this is going to be Book 7 instead. Welcome to Death of the Good People. I need to get some house cleaning things out of the way, including describing what this book is, where it takes place, what you need to remember to best enjoy this book proper when it's eventually out. Death of the Good People is two stories in one. The first is a direct follow-up to 12 Monoliths Book 1, Good People Die, as you could tell by the name. <laughs> um, if you haven't read this novel recently, I would recommend it, um, but if you have, you should be able to jump into at least this part of the story with little to no extra work as part of the story aims to tell the tale of the survivors of the roulette game after they are successfully able to escape uh, the facility where the roulette game is being played. However, being 12 Monoliths Book 7 means that this is also going to be following up on some specific plot threads introduced in 12 Monoliths Books 5 and 6, All for One Red Monolith and Death and Rebirth Orange Monolith. This is a follow-up to the Scientia and Numa plotlines introduced in both of those novels, as well as the ARG of what remains that is novelized at the end of 12 Monoliths Book 5, All for One, Red Monolith. Parts of the story are going to be taking place during the same time period of the original Good People Die novel, 1990, so about 54 years before the events of the true ending of the novel, as well as the pickup point in Become as God's Black Monolith, and other parts of the story are going to be taking place during 2021 a point in time visited by Alice and Faye during the latter 12 Monoliths books. This means that the story does not require knowledge of many of the front-facing plot elements of 12 Monoliths books 2 through 6 in order to read, but given the fact that I am following up on a number of plot threads and characters, I am still going to consider it book 7 as events revealed in this book are going to be important for moving on in books 8 through 15. This means I'm going to suggest one of two things if you're going to be reading this book. Either treat it as book seven and read the preceding six before starting this book, or much easier and faster, check out the, the story so far section that's going to immediately follow this quick prologue for a refresher of everything important you need to know for going into both parts of the story. I won't be diving deeper into the subjects of books eight and nine, but they have been decided at this point and will be announced at a further date. Now, with that out of the way, let's do some quick recapping about the events of Good People Die. In the year 1990, a boy wakes up in a strange location called the Subcon Facility that is submerged off the coast of California with no memory of his name, outside of what was written down in a notebook left by his side. It says he is Lucas Gray, and so with nothing else available, he takes the moniker and begins to explore his environment. Deeper within the facility, he finds a vacuous room, with six chairs aligned in a circle around a metallic podium, with the same number of doors at equidistant ends of the room. He finds himself strapped to the chair as he chooses to sit in. He is drugged and next wakes when the rest of the chairs have been filled. He is told he is to be a participant of a death game called the Roulette Game. The other players are... Sophie Terrius. She willingly travels to the subcon facility in an attempt to learn more about the company that she believes is responsible for the death of her father, Arctic Systems, and has been investigating the mysterious tomes that to date back to ancient history, and carry a curse inside of it, called the Eye of Timaeus. She recognizes Lucas, but by a different name, Abel. But because he lost his memory, she chooses not to reveal this information for the fear of being betrayed. She and Abel's older brother, Cain, had drugged Abel in order to bring him to the facility, as Cain had theorized that a machine they had learned about in the Eye of Timaeus could fix his legs due to his paralysis from a car accident the both boys were in. Ari Fleur. 
an underworld contract killer who was taken in because of her finding of the book, The Eye of the Tamias, after dealing with a job that nearly cost her her life. Simon Nagatomi, son of the current patriarch of the Generos Foundation, a Japanese-based company that funds Arctic systems in all manner of research endeavors, but most notably the research hosted as a result of The Eye of Tamias. He left the Foundation after repeated kidnapping attempts and became an investigative journalist, intended to uncover the corruption lying at the heart of his family's company. But he was ambushed by his father, who seemed to have become feral due to the curse of the Eye of Tamias. I, As a person, she is the ancestor of the Nagatomi family, but the woman originally born as I Nagatomi has been long since dead, and inhabited by the child of the night known as Sakana. More on Sakana and the children of the night to come. Levi Strauss, a prototype android unit that was an evolution of the testing done by Sakana and Z1, the masterminds behind the roulette game. He is the blueprint that the android Lucas Gray, more on this later, would be built. Throughout the roulette game, more information about the pasts of various characters are unveiled, such as most notably the identity crisis of the main character, Abel slash Lucas Gray. In truth, Abel is the name of the boy who was brought in to play the roulette game in 1990, and Lucas is the name of an android built by an adult Abel in the year 2044, who is experiencing the events of the past through the eyes of Abel from the present. This is because the roulette game has happened more than once. In fact, it has been happening in a constant loop for over 100 cycles. Players have won, players have lost, died, been killed, escaped, but after a certain amount of time, all six players wake up in the subcon facility to play the roulette game again with their memories of the previous cycle being wiped clean. At least, that was the intention. Something in the design of the process was flawed, as Simon Nagatomi was able to remember every single cycle, and no matter what he did or tried to do, nothing about his experience changed. Simon dies in every single cycle, and it isn't until the 100th cycle when something about the formula has truly changed. Abel Gray has remembered the previous cycle. It is due to this now destabilizing unit that, after a swift death of all the players, the 101st cycle is the first cycle where the time loop is finally broken, and the players are all able to escape the facility for good. All except Abel Gray, who decides to stay back at the last moment and spend the rest of his life creating the android known as Lucas Gray, short for Luxmund User Computer Algorithm Shifter. Utilizing the remnants of Arctic Systems technology and the blueprints of Levi Strauss to finalize the models that he can go out into the world and put to rest the machinations of the group behind the roulette game, the Children of the Night. The roulette game was a ploy constructed to quickly deal with Arctic Systems' lost of the book known as the Eye of Tamias, a historic tome full of arcane knowledge about the history of the universe, penned by an ancient philosopher named Tamias with the help from a strange old beggar who seems to resurface throughout history with immense knowledge known as Z1. In addition, it allowed Sakana to quickly and efficiently gather the energy required for later steps of their plans. Z1 is known as the creator of everything in this world, and it is through his acts that the world was split into two, the land of the light and the land of darkness. This was housed by a particular engine that has come to be known as Godsong, the dark matter engine that started the universe. The land of darkness is a despot land and places of people that used to be, separated and divided from their physical forms. Inside were twelve children that were housed within, each with lives and stories of their own that had been long ripped from them. There was only one Noctum, the land of the darkness. However, an issue came about when Luxmund, the land of the light, began growing. It grew as people that lived in the land of the light made choices for with every choice, the potential futures would grow into new universes themselves, doubling, trebling, and so on. If left unchecked, Luxmund would suffocate Noctum, and Z1 knew that this could not come to pass. He had cared for his children, and didn't want to see them snuffed out. He entered the Land of the Light, and his children were soon to follow. The Children of the Night are formless, and so when they enter Luxmund, they must take forms to adapt to the new environment as the shadows and waves they existed as would burn instantaneously upon contact with the light. So they took on ice, dust, and other space particles to form meteoroids to protect themselves from the light until they were able to inhabit vessels of human bodies to exist until they could adapt their natural forms to the light, which would eventually happen in which they would take the form of spectral creatures that glowed golden. 
Sakana would take the form of a dragon with a theater mask donned across its face. Upon landing in the mountains near a European village called Steinshield in the first century, Sakana rested for many hundreds of years until she came into contact with the populace in the 11th century. Then, later in the 1500s, she came into contact with Ai Nagatomi, and thus did the creature find its host. Thus began the plans that would create arctic systems, and Sakana utilized the heritage of the vessel she obtained to duly cultivate the generous foundation for the further steps of the children of the night. Her part of their collective plan would be to amass an immense amount of energy, such energy that would be cultivated upon the depths of the players of the roulette games nearly 500 years later. With enough energy being gathered upon the 100th cycle, Sakana and the reunited C1 have left the subcon facility to begin the next steps of their plan. Lucas, now having understood the motivations behind the Children of the Night, is evacuated out of the subcon facility before Abel causes its destruction in 2044, and heads out to the desert until he comes across a stranger who seems to match the description of a character from one of my previous books, Gavin Daniels from Telos. Now, for the story of the research and development firm Scientia, and the mysterious AI Numa. At a currently unknown period of time in Phoenix, Arizona, a research and development center named Scientia is formed. This collective has many top secret projects in development at any given period of time, but it is revealed that two workers, previously lovers who split up over a single position being available, are going to be leaving the charge on a project when they join up with Scientia's team in 2021. These two researchers are Annabelle Reed and Winry Herschel. In 2022, when the project has gotten some time to develop, it is revealed that an artificial intelligence dubbed NUMA, which acts as an observational unit, has been created. It is at this point that it has been fed countless amounts of visual data and is able to repeat back what it sees, and thus seeks out more information for further understanding. A period of time passes where events are less clear with NUMA's development until we hear back from Winry in the year 2044, where fragments of her story can be pieced together from various logs that she's recorded above Scientia's spacecraft, the Lumina. From Winry's mission logs, the following information can be gleamed about the project. It was started sometime in 2022, when the Lumina was sent out into space with Numa aboard, and a crew of a decent size, including maintenance, engineering, and research staff. Also on board was a pretty sizable residential district, with the families of staff and a makeshift suburb on board. Both Winry and Annabelle are also on board for the ship for the project, given that their works were specifically being put to the test. Winery's being Numa, and Annabelle's project being as of yet unconfirmed, but known to have collaborated on with Numa. For a number of years, the project, in whatever it was attempting to do, was going as planned, but until a certain mysterious circumstance happened that caused catastrophic failure, this led to an entire sector of the ship being ejected and crashing back to the planet. Annabelle and her direct reports were aboard this sector when it ejected. Come 2044, Winry is the lone survivor on the ship as mysterious creatures of unknown origin have invaded, being sealed off in the other sectors, and a majority of Winry's logs are her reporting on the status of the various creatures. Unfortunately, as they come closer to their end, a force of unknown intelligence seems to become aware of Winry and her logs, adding in haunting commentary, and it is revealed that Numa is still on board and is responsible for the creatures and the strange messages. Having gained immense knowledge out in the far reaches of space, she hijacks the ship and begins a crash collision with the planet. As of this current writing, Numa has developed itself an exoskeleton and has become mobile, having survived the crash, ending the life of the last of Project Numa's staff.